I'd like to start by uh, asking us a question. So often in these uh, interdisciplinary discussions, we're sometimes using the same words, but not in the same context. So one of the questions we thought um, to focus uh, the panelists and how they could situate their work is to think about the three key words that are used in the title of this panel, race, social control, and punishment, and think about how it operates in conjunction with their specific work. So they're going to start off, um, each of them doing 10 minutes based on uh, kind of exploring the topics together. So that way we can come to the conversation. <laughs> Good afternoon. Yeah. I'm Barbara Creel. I'm from the Pueblo of Jemez. Um, and I want to start by thanking my ancestors and the people who went before me um, to bring me here today. Their wisdom and knowledge allows me to speak. And I also want to thank the people, the First Nations of, of this land, um, and respecting their, their place. And um, all of you that invited me to be here and who are here to listen today, I appreciate your time. Indigenous people's rights is something that doesn't get talked about enough. And the words race, social control, crime and punishment get applied broadly to people of color. And I share all of those concerns with those broad prospects and uniquely with indigenous peoples, especially with the right to counsel. These issues are near and dear to my heart as a native woman. I've had family members who have been incarcerated, died in jail, people who have been killed um, at the hands of violence. But that's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the issues that social control has created and that history has created. There are so many negative statistics about Native people that we can look up now. The suicide rates, the incarceration rates, the um, health determinative factors that are negative. Um, but that's not what defines us. What defines us is our resilience and our survival and our ability to move forward and think about things differently. And I'm coming to, hear, coming to you today as a Native woman talking about violence on Indian reservations, which is usually framed in the idea of protecting Native women and children. The idea of allowing longer sentences in tribal, state, and federal courts to be able to protect Native women and children, when really the story is one about patriarchy, colonialism, and over-incarceration. In the end, the story is about who gets to speak for the Native, who gets to talk about these issues of social control, crime and punishment, on the reservation, off the reservation, and usually it's not a Native voice. The right to counsel in Indian country has to do with a long history of the right to counsel under the United States Constitution, as well as a separate history of Native people under the um, federal government. It starts in the 1880s, starts way before that with free contact, but the idea of the framework, the legal framework that allows us to get today to where Natives have less rights under the U.S. Constitution and are incarcerated without the right to counsel and the Supreme Court saying that's okay. The history is one of criminalizing this idea of presumption of criminality, that natives need to be rounded up, herded up, and placed on reservations in order to control um, crime and punishment. The idea starts with um, the Major Crimes Act, courts of Indian that take, takes native people off the reservation and into federal court so they can face longer sentences. Under the U.S. Sentencing uh, Commission Tribal Issues Advisory Group, we looked at these issues. Guess what? They didn't have the data. But we, just looking at the data that they did have showed that Natives are subjected to longer sentences and are punished more harshly than every other person of color except for Black African Americans. Courts of Indian Offenses, the ones that were set up by the Bureau of Indian Affairs to uh, teach Indians how to be civilized, to take away their language, take away their spirituality, their practices, and then allow them to be incarcerated uh, without any, any right to counsel. The Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968, the Tribal Law and Order Act of 2010, and then the Violence Against Women Act reauthorization most recently, and um, a law of general applicability, 18 U.S.C. 117, that creates a federal domestic violence statute, which sounds good on paper, but is specifically targeting uh, Native Americans. So this starts with an uh, ex, ex parte Crow Dog, the Major Crimes Act of 1885. This is a story about restorative justice, murder of uh, 
Spotted Tail by Crow Dog on the Dakota Reservation in Indian Territory. And Crow Dog was subjected to his own restorative justice system within his, his tribal people. He was found guilty, for lack of a better word, of murder and was sentenced to, for lack of a better word, re restore the family that had um, lost this life. He had to give blankets, food, money, and there's also an oral history that he was banished from, from the community for, for many generations. Spotted Tail was an Indian agent, meant he was paid by the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the federal government to work on the reservation as part of the control process. This was an outrage that um, one native could kill another native on the reservation, and so the federal government tried to prosecute him in federal court under the laws of the territory at the time for one specific reason. That was to subject him to the punishment at the time for federal territories, and that was the death penalty. The case went to the Supreme Court, and it was decided that there was no jurisdiction. Feds had no jurisdiction on Indian territory. These were nation-to-nation -nation relationships where Native people had tribal sovereignty and could act um, and live by their own rules and laws, especially where treaties were involved and delineated both jurisdictions, geographic, and legal. Congress swiftly acted to pass the Major Crimes Act of 1885, and this required Indians to be subjected to federal prosecution instead of um, being uh, only subjected to um, tribal prosecution or punishment. Tribes have kept their own sovereignty and ability to, to um, take care of crime and, and wrongdoing on, on, on the reservations, but it removes the Indian from his community and then puts him in front of a foreign body for that, that sentence. The other little known um, courts were the courts of Indian offenses that allowed Indian agents to punish Indians on the reservation for minor infractions, stealing, um, but also for um, moral ones, adultery or practicing a, a different religion. This was the, the framework for a long time. Tribal sovereignty um, led by tribal courts, either traditional or um, Western style, and then federal prosecution for the major crimes, the big crimes. Um, that you would think of murder, rape, robbery, arson. And this really bothered uh, Senator Sam Irvin in the civil rights era of 1960s. When he was looking at Indians' rights on and off the reservation, he uh, was the sponsor of a bill called the Indian Civil Rights Act that sub subjected Native Americans to um, a separate statute like the, the Bill of Rights because tribal sovereignty prevented the U.S. Constitution from applying on the reservation. It was one in which was, he was touted as being um, someone who was looking into civil rights of Native Americans, but really he was trying to deflect his own um, poor civil rights mm -hmm. history in his own state of North Carolina. He didn't want to talk about black civil rights and said, let's look at something else, let's go for here. In the end, it didn't do anything for Native rights with regard to um, off-reservation discrimination and punishment at the hands of white people in border towns and um, police violence that we hear about today. It only <coughs> targeted tribal governments and allowed tribes to sentence their own, own people as long as they had followed the Bill of Rights. Important piece that was missing into the Bill of Rights was the right to counsel, the Indian Civil Rights Act. No right to counsel, um, just like the courts of Indian offenses, no, in, no Indians were allowed to have attorneys to defend them. Um, the separate sovereign rule applies here. Uh, states are separate from feds. Tribes are separate from the federal government. Indians are subjected to many more uh, criminal punishments on and off the reservation because of uh, this separation. Fast forward to 1978 where the Supreme Court said Indian tribal jurisdictions don't have the right to punish white people even when they commit crimes on the reservation. Um, in this case, Justice uh, Rehnquist invented a legal theory called implicit divestiture. It's something that didn't exist before and really did, doesn't exist now, except for the fact that he um, lied and cheated when he wrote his uh, opinion to, to make this up. The Tribal Law and Order Act was one um, 
law that was celebrated as a way to comprehensively address crime and punishment on the reservation. It was a comprehensive bill that was tacked on to the Indian um, Arts and Crafts Act of uh, 2010, but also included mandates for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the DEA, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and on and on. It was one to address the, the rampant crime on reservations that has been documented by um, Amnesty International and the Denver Post series that showed that the FBI was investigating uh, crime on the reservation, but the U.S. Attorney's Office were declining um, to prosecute in federal court under the Major Crimes Act, even serious crimes like murder about 65% of the time. So it left this huge gap and the gap was filled by a federal statute that said tribes are allowed to sentence their people for longer. It didn't have anything to do with um, how we want to address the uh, treatment problems, the lack of um, education, poverty, job um, economic development, things like that that were creating the recipe for crime on the reservation. Uh, again, it was celebrated as a victory, as was the Violence Against Women Act 2013, Indian provisions that said that Indian tribes could have jurisdiction over white people only in domestic violence cases and only um, if they had specific provisions for non-Indians, which included the right to counsel. Um, all of the protections under the U.S. Constitution and the writ of habeas corpus. <coughs> This leads me to my work um, under the United States versus Bryant. Uh, 18 U.S.C. 117 makes it a crime to have a federal domestic crime when you've had two priors, including one on the Indian reservation. Um, your next, this is a habitual offender um, statute, or it's posed, posited to be, but actually it is a federal domestic violence crime that's been targeted for Indian reservations. The case um, went up before the Supreme Court this past year, and Justice Ginsburg, championing Native American women's rights, found that you could have a prior conviction, even if you didn't have an attorney, that would be valid for this um, federal domestic violence crime. So if you go before your own tribal courts and you don't have an attorney and you get convicted of domestic violence once, twice, your third strike and go to federal court and be subjected to sentences longer than if you committed serious bodily injury um, under the federal sentencing guidelines. This is Mr. Bryant, the subject of the case that went before the Supreme Court. I like to put a name to a face. This uh, man had a long criminal history and I won't um, say anything in defense of that. What I will say was that he didn't have an attorney when he faced um, incarceration during all of the times that he was um, before his, his own tribe. The tribe doesn't have any money. It relied on Indian legal <coughs> services um, in the state of Montana that occasionally were able to represent people in tribal courts. He, again, he had a long uh, criminal history, but it was related to um, alcohol-related offenses, um, disorderly conduct. There's no treatment options. And, um, on the reservation and a lack of other services that would allow people to address the underlying causes, substance abuse that caused the domestic violence. When I visited um, one tribe in the Northwest uh, as part of the U.S. Sentencing Commission, I watched um, a tribal judge sentenced Indians to longer than 30 days for minor infractions without an attorney so that they could then be eligible for uh, drug and alcohol treatment in the county. Um, so routinely giving sentences would be unethical and illegal in federal court, pleading guilty, not deciding guilt or innocence, but allowing them to get treatment. Um, again, I wanted to say that for, the, for me, this brings up who speaks for Native Americans and who gets to have their day in court. Um, when I watch the United States versus Bryant, or, or listen to the arguments in court. I saw um, the non-native Solicitor General, Assistant Solicitor General, arguing on behalf of the United States for longer sentences for Native Americans, and the non-Indian Assistant Federal Public Defender arguing on behalf of Mr. Bryant. Uh, 
and talking about sovereignty and the rights of Indian people, and nowhere in there was any humanity. The idea that none of these people, either on the court um, or the Solicitor General's office, had visited an Indian tribe, had known what it's like to live in that neighborhood, what it's like to live in tribal communities, and yet they are arguing that they're protecting Native peoples by um, allowing um, longer sentences for Indians in the name of um, safety for these communities. And um, I appreciate your time and I look forward to continuing this discussion. So I want to thank Claudia and Beth who are doing such brilliant work for uh, organizing this conference, um, for allowing me to be here, just to address the question of the terms, the kind of terms of order that we're using and that we tend to use in our work, you know, I see punishment as a mechanism or process of gendered racial social control. So um, for me, intrinsically, inevitably, criminal punishment um, in this country has been that. And, and so for me, the logical extension of that is the abolition of imprisonment as a means of solving social problems. So I just to sort of get a framework for sort of what animates me and guides me as I sort of come to these questions and these concepts. Um, and part of the reason that I think about punishment and particularly policing and imprisonment in that way is because of um, the research that I've done around black women and the history of imprisonment of black women um, in the South after the Civil War. So my work explores the role of gender in shaping the Southern convict labor system in the late 19th and early 20th century. So probably most of you know that after um, emancipation, Southern states instituted a convict lease system um, in which imprisoned people worked in various industries. I focus on Georgia, but this um, was, the convict lease system existed in much of the South. But in Georgia, imprisoned people were put to work in mining and um, turpentining and lumber industries and brick making and in farming um, and railroad, laying railroad lines. Um, and so my work looks at that regime and also the regime that replaced it, which was the chain gang in which imprisoned people um, were put to work on public roads in Georgia. So um, my particular focus is on how carceral technologies of control were central to the proliferation of gendered racial orders. To put it another way, um, my argument is that the carceral state was, and I would say still is, a gendering and ungendering regime. So through the imposition of specific um, gendered rituals of prison violence, through criminalizing representations of black women in the media, and through juridical discourse, the carceral regime produced and reproduced gendered understandings of who was and was not inside the category of human. So being, before being asked to participate in this conference, I hadn't thought about these processes as disabling ones, although disability was a key aspect of the experience of imprisoned black women um, in this moment. But the Southern convict leasing and chain gang regimes were institutions of racial control that were premised upon ideas about gender, who was considered a woman and who was not. And it's interesting to think about this framework of the conference as damage and trauma, which are also not terms that I use in my work, but which may prove really helpful. Damage in particular. I'm interested in how we might see the production of the damaged body as a condition of possibility as a necessary precondition for the production of a protected body and a protected body politic. So just to give an example from um, the sort of historical research that I do, uh, I'll, I'll just give one example. In 1908, the state of Georgia passed a law, which was ostensibly a reform. It was hailed in Georgia as this massive victory and reform because it eliminated the convict lease system that I described earlier. So the system in which prisoners would work for private companies. Um, and it replaced it with chain gangs in which prisoners worked for the state um, on the county roads, which is interesting to think about today, right? So I think we need to be careful about 
certain reforms that we argue for, right? If we're too excited about sort of the elimination of private punishment, and this is a historical example where it was replaced by an equally brutal, equally profitable public system, mm -hmm. right, of labor extraction. So the law that established chain gangs began this way. State authorities may employ the chain gang not to exceed 12 months for any one or more of these punishments in the discretion of the judge, provided that nothing herein contained shall authorize the giving of, of control to private persons in such mechanical pursuits as will bring the products of their labor into competition with the products of free labor. This is the important part. Um, if the convict be female, the judge may, in his discretion, sentence her to labor and confinement in the woman's prison of the state farm in lieu of a chain gang sentence, not to exceed 12 months. So the condition of possibility for creating this whole new system of punishment, the thing that was necessary was this exemption, was this notion that women, those considered women, would not have to labor on public roads from sunup to sundown under excruciating conditions, under the threat of whipping, um, with vulnerability to rampant disease and injury, um, that that protection had to be there in order for the system to be instituted. So after this law took, took hold in 1908, only four white women were ever sentenced to the chain gang, compared with nearly 2,000 black women. And I guess the thing that resonates to me about this, in addition to the sort of suffering, disproportionate suffering and injury that it imposes, is the operation of the law and the operation of um, the criminal punishment system. So this law essentially sort of purports to only represent and interpret a fact, right? Um, it represents sort of what the polity wanted. It represents um, a sort of moral ideal about who should and should not be put to work in hard labor, but actually it's productive. It produces truths that animate structures of social control. And so in exempting white women and imprisoning black women, the law produced a definition of womanhood femaleness even, that was racially specific, i.e. white. Um, and so just to think about the ways that law and technologies of punishment um, produce and construct the things we, we, we sort of take for granted. Um, white feminine bodies in this historical context were the only class of people in society who were exempt from chain gang punishment. So black men, white men, black women were all um, put on a chain gang. And the chain gang system was, by definition, a system of body damage. It was atrocious. Death was ubiquitous. Brutality and illness were omnipresent. And private individuals and companies continued to benefit from the labor of prisoners because imprisoned people um, basically created the modern system of county roads in Georgia, including imprisoned women. The black female body, always already incorrigible, deviant, and dissolute, operates in this Western juridical imaginary as perpetually damaged and therefore utterly destroyable. In 1912, Hattie Johnson became one of the imprisoned women caught in the system of racial and gender-specific punishment. Convicted of larceny and sentenced to 12 months on the Wilkes County chain gang, her imprisonment did not serve its intended purpose. She was of very little use to the road building project because she took a debilitating fall almost immediately after she arrived on the chain gang. She explained as much in a letter to the prison commission that was both desperate and decisive. She said, I am in no shape to be out here. I am in a family way, three months gone. It is a shame for me to be out here with all of these men. It is 26 men and if I get sick, no one knows what to do for me. Nothing but all men and me, one woman, and they carriage me out on the road every day like I was a man. In writing about Johnson, I conceptualized the letter as a recognition of how um, race and gender categories work together, about how a black woman's exclusion from the category of woman. But in light of this conference, it made me think about Johnson as elaborating her condition and subjection to punishment as a gendered and racially specific disability. <laughs> 
which is not to say that pregnancy is a disability. Um, she's talking about being in a family way, being pregnant. But perhaps that pregnancy in the context of incarceration is disabling in the sense that it leaves imprisoned women vulnerable to medical trauma and medical neglect is traumatizing. There's also something in Johnson's letter that reflects the racial and gendered hierarchies of bodies as a taxonomy of ability and disability, right? as an organization of fully able and disabled bodies. The idealization of white feminine bodies through the chain gang legislation and the judicial interpretation of it, judges had to decide every time someone came before them, right, every single time that they were not going to send this person or that person to the chain gang. Um, so this idealization of white feminine bodies positioned them as fragile and therefore unsuited for hard labor, but paradoxically also supremely able, the most able bodies in society idealized as eminently human and therefore exempt from the threat of carceral violence. In this way, Hattie Johnson's conceptualization of her plight affirms Cydia Hartman's assertion that white supremacy, quote, engendered black femaleness as a condition of unredressed injury. If that's the case, carcerality is a regime that both, both consolidates political knowledge and imposes its brutal reality through the caging and violence. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Amina, as just to give you a refresher, I'm the executive director of the National Lawyers Guild of Los Angeles. I also worked for several years with CARE, the Council on American Islamic Relations, doing legal work and civil rights work there. Um, I thought I'd start off by talking a little bit about where I'm personally at and where I'm not at. Is that, is that all right with everyone? Keep it real, right? Um, where I'm at, I want to thank everyone for inviting me here. Um, I want to thank you for being here. It's such an important topic and so timely. Um, where I'm not at, I'm feeling very sick and unwell. And I, I really appreciate Dean Nelson's talk this morning and touching upon wellness, too, because it is a reality many of us advocates are very currently facing, is that stressed out, overworked, undernourished, and tired leads to perpetual sickness. Um, where I'm at is I was very happy yesterday um, hearing about another legal victory with respect to the Muslim ban. But before I could celebrate, we were hearing about over 100 people who were swept up in ice raids yesterday across the greater LA area. So I didn't, as many of us, we didn't have time to really celebrate because we mobilized and got, got out on the streets in front of the ICE detention center. Where I'm at, um, after the, the, the morning after the election, like so many of you, I had to have that, the chat with my kids about what happened. Um, my little girl, who is almost seven years old, said to me, um, Mommy, does this mean we have to leave? And it broke my heart. But as I thought more about it during the day of, you know, how I'm going to protect her, how I'm going to save this world for her, I also recognized that me feeling this, this gut reaction to protect my baby for the first time on that day in that way also exemplified my privilege. Because I have not, she didn't, I didn't have to raise her that way. You know, I'm not like certain moms in black community, indigenous, com indigenous communities who have to wake up every single morning since the birth date of their children wondering if their kids are going to grow up into adulthood or spend the rest of their lives in prison. So I recognize that privilege um, and that's where I'm at. And this kind of gets into what I wanted to talk to about a little bit today with respect to the topic at hand is about the guild, movement, lawyering, and how that all relates to race and, and lawyering and advocating with uh, communities that are both impacted, communities that are somewhat privileged in some respects, and then also community, communities that have faced trauma. Um, and more specifically, my experience is obviously with the American Muslim community because that's the community um, I've dealt with. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give a, a brief overview because I think some of the more nuanced issues will come up later in the Q&A.
So movement lawyering it under underlies the philosophy of the Lawyers Guild, which has been which came up with the rise of the labor movement in the 1930s. So it's an approach to lawyering in which we believe that change should be movement led, led by the movement organizations that have been doing this work on the streets, and that we use our skills and resources to support those movement groups, groups who are, who are working in the community, such that um, human rights are valued over property interests. So again, this sounds very basic, but it's not easy because so many of us lawyers and others have gotten to where we are due to some degree of privilege. Um, aside from jokes about lawyers being sharks and ambulance chasers, it is a privileged position of society of wealth, of, of wealth and education. And um, frankly, it is a it is lawyers are not as diverse as they could be. And I've noticed that it's in response to the Trump election when many lawyers and advocates seem to be more interested in grouping together and creating some sort of further elite status within the alto Trump response, like lawyers for this, this, and that, rather than being on the streets with the communities, just lending their skills to the community groups and being perfectly fine with anonymity. So in movement lawyering, we take a step back as much as we step up to the plate. And we do not define the response or direct it, but we help amplify the voices of those movement actors to promote the political power of movement groups and to dismantle the structures of oppression and the systems of control. And yes, it's very difficult for many of us um, because those are the same structures of power and privilege that enabled us to get the education and do what we do. So what are some of the traits and how does this manifest de dealing with um, traumatized communities and communi impacted communities? So first of all, um, we have to understand that when we deal with traumatized communities, we, need, we help and offer to buffer and insulate and protect them. We try to help empower what is called the hidden transcripts of those community groups, those conversations within community members that they have with each other when no one's listening. And we help and empower and raise those voices. Now when dealing with a traumatized community, it can be difficult because are those voices the result of the trauma? And so many of our communities in the Muslim American community, for example, over the last 15 years, has kind of shifted its whole narrative to be a very sort of pro-country, pro-patriotic, how do we appease the white power structures? And are those the hidden transcripts? And if so, are those the ones we want to lift up? And then it, it, it does become sort of like this internal battle of, do I take what I've learned and what I know and I've experienced with other groups, and how do I sort of help guide the conversation within those communities? Now, I will say this, if you're not part of the community, that's gonna be difficult. And that's another reason why sort our um, why our associations and our groups really need to be um, have a more concerted effort to raise up the communities of the voices of color um, and impacted groups within those professions, because they they are the best positions in a lot of ways to have those conversations within the communities to make sure it's not coming from a patronizing place. Um, and I'll get into more examples of that soon um, during the Q and A. Movement lowering within privileged communities. So I, I started off by talking about where I'm at, where I'm not at. And as I, as I belong to an impacted group, part of it is, is a place of privilege. Now within the Muslim community and speaking about race and, and class and everything, Muslim, Islam is a religion, right? It, it's not a biographical genetic race. It's a religion. I'm actually half white and half Pakistani. Many of you probably thought I was Arab. Um, you know, my mom converted to Islam, so she, being a white American, accepted Islam and became like a woman of color. I grew up without a headscarf when I was, you know, younger. When I was 14, and I passed because, you know, I was white. Um, even I had a different name, different practices, but when I started wearing hijab, I am now a part of a community of color. Um, Although I always identify that way, I'm talking about in terms of how the broader society may perceive me. So Islam, being a religion, we have people belonging to multiple classes. 
right? Mm -hmm. All the way, from, you know, from someone who's homeless all the way to people who are own these mansions. Um, we have different races. Um, we have uh, different educational levels and different relations to the state, right? So with a lot of people who, who are advocating, it's really important to understand that we cannot enable the voices just because they are Muslim or belong to an impacted community because their relation to the state and to systems of control, it might actually be in their individual interest to perpetuate those systems of control. And so that's really, really hard to understand and to, to grapple with, which again, I go back to, that's why we need to raise up voices within these communities because we, we get it, right? Um, and so with, when dealing with communities that have a level of relative privilege and that are more hesitant to dismantle some um, power structures, a lot of this is, is we have a different tact with, with a lot of those communities. It starts with political education and creating alliance and partnerships between those impacted groups and other far more impacted groups. Um, and always, always, always respecting that everyone has different entry points to this cause. It's not like a race to the top or a race to the bottom. That's my alarm. Um, that everyone has different entry points. And while we recognize that, we have to also understand that when we talk about liberation of one community, when it comes down to it, we're talking about basic liberation of the black community. We're talking about the National Lawyers Guild is actually a prison abolitionist organization. And um, we have to make sure that every step we take is a step towards dismantling those power structures. And that those are actual very real conversations we have within the guild, when it, whether it's in terms of dis, um, gang injunctions, whether it's in terms of national security issues, um, whether it's in terms of economic violence, evictions, those are all very real conversations that we have. And I'd be happy to go into more details and examples during the, the roundtable part. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Rachel Mirapol, and I want to start off by saying just what an absolute treat it is to be here today with so many amazing women doing so much awesome work. Um, it's a hard time for all of us, I think, and taking the time away from our work to be here and learn from each other um, feels like a real luxury, and um, it's really inspiring. So I am a staff attorney at the Center for Constitutional Rights. Um, CCR was founded in 1966 by lawyers who were doing support work for civil rights activists in the South. And it has existed ever since then, um, sort of doing national work. We're based in New York, but we litigate nationally and internationally. Um, we bring impact litigation cases. So we bring sort of large cases, frequently class actions, um, but similar to the model of the National Lawyers Guild, we try, we strive in all of those cases um, to work within the law where there is a community that is in action, where there are um, impacted individuals or activists or groups who are inviting um, lawyers into their struggle to use the law as one tool towards making social change. So we try to connect uh, litigation to um, community struggle. Uh, I have been at CCR since 2002, since right after I graduated from law school. And I've actually been working on um, well, a series of cases that I'm going to talk about more during sort of the roundtable portion, but I want to start by talking a little bit about a case that has been going on since 2002. It was the very first thing I worked on um, when I got to CCR as a brand new lawyer, um, and it's now pending in the United States Supreme Court. Um, so this is a case stemming from the post 9-11 immigration detentions, right? So I'm sure most of you, many of you remember Right after 9-11, um, hundreds of Muslim, Arab, and South Asian men were sort of swept up off the streets. Um, it happened across the country, but it was really sort of most focused in the New York and New Jersey area. Um, and these are men that came to the attention of law enforcement, primarily based on uh, anonymous tips from citizens, right? So after 9-11, everyone's all terrified, and then they call in the FBI hotline with something like, my neighbor's Arab, and he keeps strange hours, and I think he might be a terrorist. <laughs> And literally based on a tip like that, 
An INS, FBI, and NYPD officer would be dispatched to investigate the individual. If at the end of that interview, it was determined that they were here in violation of the immigration law, so had overstayed a visa, working without a permit, um, they were arrested and held in connection to the terrorism investigation, held as suspected terrorists, simply because they uh, fit the profile of the 9-11 hijackers, right? Certain religion from certain uh, countries and had violated the immigration law. Um, so uh, as Amina so rightly pointed out, you know, this is not a, um, a single racial group that we're talking about, although some scholars, I think, have started to talk about, you know, the race of appearing Muslim, um, which is how um, these men were basically grouped together and treated um, by the Department of Justice, by the FBI, as suspected terrorists, based absolutely on no evidence at all that they had any connection to terrorism or had even committed any crimes simply for violating the immigration law and fitting a certain profile. Um, so CCR filed a lawsuit challenging uh, the 9-11 detentions in 2002, and we are still litigating it. <clears throat> um, and it's, re it's really hard to keep a lawsuit connected to a social movement when it takes 15 years to even take the first step to hold high-level officials accountable for their violations of the Constitution. And, and that's what we're trying to do in this case. Um, after all the men were rounded up, many of them were held in the Metropolitan Detention Center in Brooklyn in solitary confinement and treated as terrorists. They were locked in their cells 23 to 24 hours a day. They were kept from practicing their religion. They were beaten, they were harassed. Um, they were denied contact with the outside world until they were cleared affirmatively of any connection to terrorism by the FBI and the CIA, and then they were deported. So CCR filed a damage action in 2002, not just against the guards at the Metropolitan Detention Center who sort of directly abused our clients, um, but also against John Ashcroft, then Attorney General, uh, Robert Mueller, then Director of the FBI, and James Ziegler, then a Commissioner of the INS, saying that the high-level federal, federal officials who created the policies that re led to this racial and religious profiling and abuse had to themselves be held personally accountable to deter future federal officials, like the ones we have right now, from feeling like they can violate the Constitution with impunity and that they will never be held personally responsible. And that's actually the question that's before the Supreme Court right now. Um, can you bring a damage action against a high-level federal official who creates a policy to violate the Constitution, to violate clearly established constitutional law? Can you hold them personally accountable? I think a lot of folks would imagine that the answer is obviously yes. But it's actually not, and none of these cases have ever successfully held any high-level official accountable for individual damages. Even when there's clear constitutional violations, this would be sort of the very first time that the Supreme Court will explicitly decide um, uh, whether, you know, whether that's possible or not. And what the, you know, first the Bush administration and then the Obama administration um, and now the Trump administration have argued is that when government officials create a policy that impacts national security and immigration, even if that policy violates equal protection, clearly established constitutional rights, you cannot hold the creators of that unconstitutional policy um, personally responsible for their actions. Um, and the, you know, the fundamental problem with that argument is that if we cannot hold these officials accountable, there is nothing to deter them from continuing to violate the law over and over again. Um, the other sort of explicitly um, discriminatory defense that we hear come up over and over again in these cases um, is this idea that law enforcement officers aren't actually you know, being racist when they round people up based on religion, ethnicity, race, country of origin. It's just that it's impossible to separate law-abiding Muslims from terrorists. 
in this day and age before you investigate them. And that is an incredibly, an incredibly destructive argument, right? And it's exactly the argument that the United States Supreme Court accepted in Korematsu when um, upholding Japanese internment. It was the same idea that the, the court, the Supreme Court of our country saying, um, we will accept the military's determination that we cannot separate the loyal from the disloyal before an investigation into them. And, and that is the justification being um, offered today, um, not just by this new administration, but by the Obama administration and by the Bush administration before them. So um, that's, that's kind of you know, where we are right now at, at a sort of fundamental crossroads in terms of whether you can hold high level officials accountable. Um, and the Supreme Court will be deciding that in, in you know, the next couple of months. Um, and I hope to sort of talk more about sort of cases of this nature um, and the individual stories of the people who um, underwent these detentions and sort of um, are struggling in other areas as well as we move into the roundtable portion. Thank you. Each of you in your papers touch on health a little bit, but I want us to take a moment giving the um, given what Repair has been about in Claudia and Beth's excellent leadership in bringing a bunch of people into the conversations of disability from different disciplines. But, um, and I was hoping that we could take a minute and think about how health operates in your work. I mean, we touched on it in terms of treat lack of treatment for American Indians. Um, certainly, Sarah touched on it in terms of punishment uh, in relation to health. Um, all of you have touched whether you know the excessive abuse in jails and in incarceration and not being even to hold anybody accountable to those dam damages. Um, it has been touched on by each of you, but if we can just take a minute to think about how uh, these processes work, social control and punishment work in relation to health disparities, uh, that would be great. I, I do think that it's the basic um, ideas that we heard this morning that the stress of living in an economically depressed area, the lack of economic development, the lack of jobs, um, the lack of access to health care is um, one that comes up over and over again that leads to um, um, both a hopelessness on and off the reservation that then leads to this idea that natives um, are relegated to a particular place in the socioeconomic status and then allows us to perpetuate those ideas our, ourselves. Um, I think basic nutrition, poverty and nutrition um, are important in, in my communities. Um, we're trying to address the um, moving away from traditional farming has led uh, our communities to have um, uh, no access to um, healthy foods. Um, the lack of treatment, the lack of treatment, the lack of Treatment is what I would I would keep saying over and, and over again. In addition to um, the poverty and um, nutrition ideas, we have, we do have a case in the clinic now where we have an individual facing um, tribal court um, in a criminal prosecution, and he has a traumatic brain injury, and there aren't any services to get him evaluated to see if he's competent to stand trial in the way that we think um, under the Sixth Amendment under the U.S. Constitution. And so we're looking at litigating the ideas of what, when you don't have access to, to health care and the court doesn't have any money to order an evaluation, is that a per se violation of, of moving forward? Can, can we just say, do, do, just dismiss this case because you can't prove that he's competent or do we have to bear that burden of going out and finding money, um, six, eight, uh, $1,200 to do a, a classic um, psychological evaluation? I guess I would say that, is it working? Is yeah. it not? <laughs> My mic issues. Um, I guess I would say that, you know, there's a couple of ways. I think imprisonment and policing as a regime is a priority um, and really the kind of only big gov government priority that most governments will acknowledge, right, that robs us of the resources to create other kinds of institutions for healthcare, um, hospitals, aid. So I think institutionally and structurally, it's a system that 
you know, prevents the possibility of quality health care for all people. But I also think, you know, in California, um, there's a massive, um, I don't know if this was discussed this morning, but massive crisis in, um, with respect to suicides among women in California prisons. And so when you think about um, suicides and attempted suicides, when you think about the traumatizing impact of just the um, condition of being imprisoned, you know, prisons as inherently violent and um, depriving of the resources for health care, you know, um, I think it's a crisis that we're sort of facing. And then just the last way to think about it, I think today, is the ways in which incarceration um, reinforces the kinds of regimes of um, precariousness and injury that women face in general. So the ways in which women are criminalized for acts of survival, right, and punished for acts of survival is another sort of, I guess, obvious way in which just imprisonment <coughs> itself, but particularly, you know, the racial and gendered way in which um, criminal punishment plays out in this country um, institutionalizes injury, right? It institutionalizes a lack of access to health care, you know, because, I mean, people are reticent to go to call for help, right, when that inaugurates a system of caging and prosecution, so. This one is, this doesn't seem to be on. Hello? Yeah. All right, excellent, thank Everybody you. Everybody use that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about um, CCR's uh, case challenging prolonged solitary confinement at Pel Pelican Bay Prison here in California. Um, because this is a case in which sort of health and disability has functioned in just an incredibly complex and um, challenging way for those of us lawyers working with sort of the prisoners who've organized themselves around this issue. Um, as I suspect many of you know, um, prisoners in California until recently was a real leader in solitary confinement, um, incarcerating more men for longer in more debilitating conditions of solitary confinement than any other state in the country. Um, and based on absolutely um, no, um, not, not based on misconduct, sort of not based on violations in prison, but rather based on allegations of gang association. So once a prisoner was determined to be a gang affiliate, um, even if they had never broken a prison rule, um, they were placed in solitary confinement and would basically stay there for um, the rest of their sentence, many men for 10, 20, 30 years. Um, so CCR got involved in this case after 2011, after um, some of the prisoners in solitary confinement organized themselves to um, have a series of hunger strikes to draw attention to solitary confinement as a human rights abuse. And that was sort of their language that they're using about looking at um, their treatment as a human rights abuse. Um, we got involved in the case, but sort of immediately came up against um, the framework that the law uses um, in determining whether something is cruel and unusual punishment. And that had been previously only to recognize sort of solitary confinement as violating the Constitution when it leads to a diagnosable mental illness, right? When it literally drives someone crazy in a diagnosable way. Um, and it does that very frequently. Um, so, you know, social scientists and academics have studied the effects of solitary confinement. And for many, many individuals, it leads to really serious um, psychological and, and physical health repercussions. Um, but others react differently, right? Others, um, uh, what we see frequently is that individuals sort of just withdraw into themselves and experience something um, of a social death, right? That their only way to survive in that type of situation, devoid of contact with other people for so long, is to actually further self-isolate. Um, and this is not sort of a damage that the law had recognized as um, amounting to a constitutional violation. So frequently when lawyers in the past had challenged solitary confinement, they had gone out to find plaintiffs who were the most obviously outwardly damaged, right? Who had developed hallucinations, um, attempted suicide, um, sort of other um, 
really obvious manifestations of harm. Um, but the prisoners in Pelican Bay and across the state of California wanted to make the point that solitary confinement violates the Constitution for every human being who is subjected to it, no matter what you know, sort of your own personal, physical, or emotional reaction to it is, no matter what way you choose to cope with it. Um, and they organized themselves and sort of organized our lawsuit in a way to continually try to make that point. Um, under their leadership and sort of working with a series of experts, um, sort of psychological experts, um, physical health doctors, um, social scientists who study sort of the importance of touch and social interaction for all human beings. Um, I think we were able to present to California an incredibly compelling case about just how damaging, as well as counterproductive, solitary confinement is, and the fact that it, it, it that courts cannot allow human beings to be treated in this way. And we actually settled the case last year um, in what I think was an incredibly successful settlement. And so far throughout this whole year, hundreds um, of men have now been released from solitary confinement in California and sent to the general population in California prisons. But that brings us to sort of an even more <laughs> Which is, so that's what they're fighting for, right? And that's what we're fighting for, for them. But then where are they actually released to? You know, they're released to maximum security California prisons, which even when they're not explicitly solitary confinement, involve incredibly little out of cell time, little programming, little mental health support, um, and the mental health support that there is, is incredibly sort of, you know, unappealing to the prisoners who have been sort of psychologically and physically abused by the prison system for so long that then are you going to sort of turn to your abuser for help. Um, so now we're in a situation where post-legal victory and post-organizing victory, the individuals who organize this movement have been diffused throughout the prison system um, making their continued organizing so much more difficult. And they are struggling intensely with the repercussions of spending 20 years in solitary confinement. You know, that's not something that goes away the moment you're released. In fact, it's something that, you know, starts to manifest in worse symptomology, I think, after release, because they've had to sort of construct their beings to function in an incredibly inhumane system. Um, so now it's incredibly difficult for them to interact with other people, you know, to be around sort of large groups of people. And, and what they're experiencing now is something that, you know, the law has no ability really to rectify. It's not, you know, it's not something we can win through the courts, getting them sort of the support and the help they need. Um, and so that's something to really, that I think the whole legal team um, and the prisoners themselves are really strug struggling with now is after, you know, what seems like such an amazing victory, and it is an amazing victory, there is still so much work to be done to um, just counteract the incredible damage that has been done um, to these men and, and to their communities as well, of course. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I think what I would want to touch upon is mental health issues and how it relates to the criminalization and national security framework um, within the American Muslim community. The first um, way I've seen this manifest is that surveillance and discrimination being a sort of trigger for um, what might be underlying pre um, predispositions for mental health issues. So for example, um, I had a, a woman who uh, was coming in complaining of employment discrimination. She was play, facing employment discrimination at work. Now, every email she read, everything she saw was a uh, conspiracy within her employment to try and attack her. I had another woman um, and many cases of people who fear government surveillance. Um, so it could start with like an FBI visit, which we call, um, they call threat assessments, which we call fishing expeditions and knock at the door. Now all of a sudden the person is seeing helicopters follow them. Um, I had one case once of a woman insisting that she was being followed, her car was being followed, um, helicopters were um, following her. And when I tried to explain, again, I'm not a mental health expert, so this was a learning experience for her, for me, that they don't need helicopters, they have drones. <laughs> to, to surveil everyone and they don't have the resources to have a helicopter. Now all of a sudden she's seeing drones following her. 
um, and it was a very um, unfortunate um, incident. But you know, when we would get cases like that, we would always tell the person, "You can't, you can't tell somebody who's suffering from paranoid schizophrenia." Go see, go see a doctor because now you're part of the conspiracy. So we would say things like, this must be very stressful for you. You know, there's an imam slash therapist, why don't you go speak to them? Um, so now there's that sort of weight now on people within these um, religious institutions to now be mental health professionals. And that's why we need more people trained as prof professional mental health professionals rather than just people who might pose as it. Um, We've seen a lot of the FBI targeting people with mental health issues. In fact, many, many of the counterterrorism operations by the FBI over the last 15 years have targeted specifically people, young um, Muslim men who exhibit mental health issues. So what they would do is have an agent provocateur <laughs> slash informant approach that person and try to befriend them, try to make them feel like they're coming out of the social social isolation that they might have ever otherwise felt, and all of a sudden this poor young man is now um, at the center of a counterterrorism plot, and now is in, um, now goes through a criminal trial and is in prison and faces many of the conditions of confinement that Rachel spoke about. Um, we've also seen a growing program called the Countering um, Viol Violent Extremism Program, CVE, which essentially um, Sorry, which essentially criminalizes um, ideology. It, it's almost like pre-crime. So it encourages communities to actually report on each other. So what might actually be a bona fide political dissent is now painted as perhaps a perhaps an issue that law enforcement needs to get involved with because now they might be a violent extremist. And that manifests also with people who do have mental health issues are often reported on. So when you're dealing with a community like many in the Muslim community, South Asians, I would say Amemsa, Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian, Amemsa communities, where mental health issues are not acknowledged, talked about, um, diagnosed, and treated. So that's the first la layer. And now on top of that, you have people who are afraid to get help because of its potential relation to law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So now you're having a whole population of people who need to be treated. Just a couple of... Um, who are not otherwise receiving treatment. A couple of other examples of cases that I, I dealt with, um, I had a young autistic man. Um, he was autistic, he was Pakistani, he was about maybe 21 years old, so still he was, high, he was low functioning autistic, so still under the care of his parents, but he w was flying on an airplane one day on his own, um, and he, um, took a water bottle to the bath, an empty water bottle to the bathroom. Um, for you, those of you who are not familiar with the Muslim faith, and you know, we, this is like a portable bidet, you get what I'm saying, <laughs> for, for bathroom use. Um, somebody saw his autistic behavior, his antisocial behavior, and saw him take an empty water bottle to the bathroom. They reported this to the flight attendant, and the flight attendants then reported it to the FBI. So not only was he approached on the aircraft for his aberrant, potentially terrorist behavior, but now he's at home being followed up with by FBI agents for exhibiting this behavior. And when I had to explain to the FBI agents, my client is just, he's autistic, and I had to literally provide medical records. I mean, this just really shows the level to which the lack of understanding, I w and I wouldn't just pin it to lack of understanding, because some of it is deliberate, right? <laughs> So part of it is lack of understanding for mental health issues, but part of it is a deliberate taking advantage of people who have mental health issues. Well, thank you. I think for the sake of time, I'm gonna combine these next two questions, um, and you can answer it as, as you'd like, but um, the question is, what do you see as lawyers, practitioners, historians, a little bit of both, those working with communities, as possible impacts in relation to uh, the new administration? And just the follow-up question part of that was, uh, part of the systems of control include controlling. What is a socially acceptable challenge to those systems? Holds barred versus no hold barred ruled, uh, rules of engagement. How has, the perpetuated, how has this perpetuated the systems of control? And do you see this changing under the Trump administration? 
So basically, if we're wondering where the current moment is at, I mean, every day we wake up and there's a, a new threats, whether it be to Black Lives Matter, the protesters at Standing Rock, etc. So I'm just combining these uh, questions to think about where social control punishment and these issues stand right now. Because I, I myself worry every day that something violent is going to occur on and off tribal lands. Um, I'll just say very quickly uh, that I think, you know, part of what the mass incarceration is, is the criminalization of dissent. And it's the thing, one of the things that I worry about being ramped up so much in this moment. I mean, just yesterday with um, uh, the appointment of Sessions and Trump announcing a new executive order that basically, you know, is very pro esque you know, giving rampant, rampant, widespread authority and um, violent authority to police. So I think that that's the thing that I think about the most because it is, it, you know, so prohibitive in terms of us making other kinds of changes. So I'll just say that. Um, I think part of part of the way that this is manifested is is sort of um, erasure from our history of our radicalism and our radical responses to systems of control. Um, the other day, I was uh, somebody had asked, was questioning Black Lives Matter response in the streets, you know, because Black Lives Matter's known and, and stated tactic is to disrupt, um, to disrupt places of privilege, um, to not, since their spaces are obviously constantly disrupted, to disrupt other spaces. So somebody was like, we don't really understand that, you know, like, why do that? The pu there's no public sympathy for it. And I think that part of the reason why we question some of those tactics is because that we forget since the inception of this, of our country, about the radical responses to systems of control. That the fact that the black community had much of its leadership assassinated during the 60s and 70s, especially those radical actors assassinated or imprisoned. Um, the fact that that now we deal with other communities um, that are facing similar impacts, and now they sort of have this uh, this idea of well, you know, if we if we need to respond with we need to respond within the system, right? And I'm I'm not taking down civic engagement. What we need to be civic engagement, you know, contacting your electives and this and this and this. But there is definitely a history in our in our country that change is effective when people really take to the streets and push for change. And that that political education of communities of who are facing these impacts is, is very needed. And I think the difference is under the Trump administration is because everyone's on the chopping block, that political education is happening at a very, very fast rate. Mm -hmm. And so we see a lot of alliances, we see a broader movement building, and we, we have people who are very aware that if they had been benefiting from the system before, it's temporal, right? It's, it's going to go away. And now we all have something to put up, and we all have to put up what we have, um, our lives, whatever it takes to dismantle these structures. Um, so, you know, I think sometimes as lawyers um, who work in the injustice system, um, we have to struggle not to internalize sort of some of the rules of engagement that um, we are supposed to live with, and that's that's a really hard thing to do, right? Um, because we function in that system. Um, and uh, so one of the things that um, we sort of feel um, in the Pelican Bay case that was so important was to ensure that because we, fo we function in that system and because we don't, we're not living um, what it's like to be incarcerated here in California, um, that we can't actually, as lawyers, be as radical as we need to be. And that means the people who can be that radical need to have a seat at the table, and what we can do as lawyers is facilitate them getting that seat at the table, right? So I think CDCR, you know, California Department of Corrections, is used to lawyers challenging prison conditions, and you know they know how to respond to that. Um, what is more sort of fundamentally challenging to them, and I think more uh, fundamental, is to actually uh, create a space for prisoners 
to speak directly to the people who run the prison system, to directly explain to them what they're experiencing, and to have a role in creating a remedy. Um, so one of the pieces of the settlement that I think the whole legal team and sort of the group of plaintiffs are proudest of is that our monitoring of the settlement includes an explicit role for the prisoners to be involved in monitoring and to speak directly to um, department officials about how they are finding the implementation of the settlement and all the many problems with it that they are experiencing. Um, and that's something that you know, has been really a learning curve for the representatives, the prisoner representatives, and California as well, who I think they thought initially what it meant for prisoners to sort of have a meeting with them once a year is that they were gonna, you know, get on the phone and be like, so this is what we're doing to monitor your settlement, now you're gonna listen to us for half an hour while we talk to you about what we're doing to implement your settlement. Um, and of course the prisoners thought that that was ridiculous, they have to listen to them all the time in prison, why would they argue for a term in their settlement to just create another opportunity where they have to listen to prison officials, right? Um, and they said, no, we're gonna talk first and we're gonna set the agenda and you're gonna listen to us and if you wanna give us a report about uh, the settlement, you can give us a written report, we don't need to listen to you, you know, talk about it. Um, so I think that's sort of that, that challenge to sort of what institutions and systems expect as the rules of engagement is, is really important to keep moving on. Um, and then I want to say one sort of optimistic thing about um, the current regime, um, and that's that it's so just batshit crazy <laughs> that um, that people are starting to understand the stakes a little bit more, you know. And I think that um, that if it, when I imagine sort of this case, the Turkmen case, the, the Ziegler v. Abbasi, which I've been I talked about earlier and which has been going on for 15 years. You know, if we were arguing that case in the Supreme Court when Hillary Clinton was president, I don't think it would, it, it would be possible for people to understand the importance of holding federal officials accountable, right? And now people understand that. And, and, and that's, that's really key, right? Like after 9-11, there was some really intense repression going on, but we didn't see the same kind of, um, uh, real public awareness of it and 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 people taking to the streets people were kind of scared and silent back then and that's changed a lot from now to then and so you know i, I think we as a movement are in a much 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 stronger place right now and that's you know at least one tiny thing to be happy about thank you this is really highly personal for me as a Native person and as an attorney, because in Native communities, you don't stand up and talk to the powers that be, which are usually your elders. You um, know your role in the community and, and you know your purpose. And um, the, a defender is a particular role in a community. It doesn't mean um, legal advocacy in the same way that we think of it. And so what Native communities, one of the reasons I want to go through all the history with you is that what Native communities have done is legitimize the Western adversary system and bring it over into their communities in order to be recognized as real courts or real governments. And that has supplanted the idea of Native restorative justice. So as an attorney in my own community, if I'm standing up for one of my um, community members, in challenge, I'm challenging their sovereignty of my own tribe. And other people see me as someone who is challenging sovereignty. The way that this has all been set out for us as Native people is that sovereign governments get to make decisions and Native people get to follow them. And that has come down from on high, from the federal from the federal um, overlay that we have, and that Native peoples have accepted that. And so when, when I try to talk about these issues in Native communities, it, it, it's already really uncomfortable um, to talk about challenging the norms, uh, suing a tribe in federal court. You're going outside and asking an outsider to look at what's going on inside. So this is really a vulnerable position for me. But I'm using this 
the opportunity that um, Rachel was talking about, that we can look at our tribal courts and say, look at the importance of the judiciary. If we're gonna mirror the Western style of courts, let's look at the importance of having a neutral, impartial decision maker review some of the actions of the government and decide whether these are purposeful or harmful, constitutional or legitimate, whether that's helping our community or not. Um, and so that's one of the things that I have to deal with personally is dealing with this idea that I'm somehow challenging sovereignty by, by doing work on behalf of individuals, again, vis-a-vis -vis their communities. The other thing that I have issue with um, is my daughter and I talk about this a lot. Um, you, hear, you hear people that are standing up for um, refugees and, and immigrants and saying, we're, we're a nation of immigrants, we're a nation of immigrants. And that, that we have to like take that all apart, right? And say, yes, we're standing up for that too, but not everyone <laughs> is an immigrant, right? Some of us were here and were imposed upon that, that by these others that, that came after us. And then now are making those decisions. And so it's a little bit of, um, spins me out a little bit sometimes, <laughs> definitely. Um, Preaching core values of American idealism is really important, and I believe in the Constitution and want to uphold it. But from a Native perspective, um, having other people you know, say we're, we're a nation of immigrants is, is really um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I made a sign recently said that had a little asterisk. Not all of us. Some were here through slavery. Some were here <laughs> already here. <laughs> My daughter said it was way too academic, which gets me to the next question. <laughs> what are some of the challenges and opportunities uh, in organizing, mobilizing, or representing communities that have survived historic or more recent systems of mass incarceration or other systems of control? And while we're talking about this, you know, I, I know we have a, we have three lawyers and Sarah on the panel, but yeah, I can't, I'm not answering. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, or, but what are some ways outside of the law even, or how can the law and grassroots mobilizing and organizing work to inform each other, um, uh, inform each other to get us to uh, different sorts of places, right? Um, maybe I'll just start by talking a little bit about some of the challenges. Um, just that I think one of our um, goals at CCR is to always make sure that sort of human stories are going to be told and that um, through a, a lawsuit could sort of help the public understand that people who are um, abused, who are exposed to trauma are, are human beings and that when they can't, um, perhaps because they're in prison or maybe they're at Guantanamo Bay or sort of when they can't tell their story directly, we want to try to tell their story um, and make sure it's a human story. Um, but on the other hand, sometimes when people are, um, have been exposed to trauma, have undergone you know, a really difficult situation in incarceration or other abuse, talking about what has happened to them is actually sort of a re-traumatizing experience and is not what they need, right? And lawyers generally um, don't know uh, sort of how to pick up on those cues or how to even sort of like confront the question is, you know, is, is my advocating for you? Is my forcing you to talk about what happened to you a good thing for you or a bad thing for you, right? Um, and, and there's no answer there because it's gonna be different for different people. And sometimes it's a good thing and sometimes it's a bad thing. And so I guess um, the only piece of advice I, I'd share on that is to recognize that it could go either way, you know, that someone's not always going to enjoy or be helped by the experience of having the opportunity to tell you their story, right? Um, sometimes that's actually going to be a, a problem. And um, so we, we just had this, you know, something that to me, uh, I experienced it as an amazing event. Um, when uh, during the 9-11 detentions, um, two of my clients were brothers and they were held at different floors of the prison, the Metropolitan Detention Center, and the guards let them write letters back and forth to each other over the six months that they were detained separately. And the letters are beautiful. Um, and recently we partnered with WNYC in New York and the Public Theater to do sort of a dramatic reading of their letters, um, which was amazing and so moving for me to experience. 
And I don't know yet if it was a good experience for the brothers themselves who had tried to get visas to come back to the country to watch the Supreme Court argument and to be present at that event and were denied visas and treated very rudely when they um, went in for their visa interview. Um, and then, you know, couldn't be there and watched sort of, you know, uh, online this performance of their letters and their pain. Um, so, it's important that we tell these stories, but it's also important that we examine, you know, whose benefit we're doing it for. I think it also moves to the next question and complicates some things here too and think about how we uh, might address issues in our communities without adding to misconceptions, producing more harm, or erasing the strengths and beauty of indigenous community and communities of Keller Hold. This comes from thinking through Eve Tuck's uh, work where she calls for suspending damage-centered research, right? So while we're, it's kind of just trying to complicate, uh, how do we begin to get past just the damaging effects of things and move towards uh, where our strengths lie, right? We always tell my daughter we survived 500 years, Trump's hopefully will just be four. <laughs> one less. One less. <laughs> so I would say, first of all, um, a lot of what the communities uh, suffer from is what we know as the chilling effect. So the chilling effect on their free speech, chilling effect on this and that. And, and the problem is that, like she said, when we, when we talk about some of the things, we actually perpetuate the chilling effect. Even a simple know your rights workshop can enhance the chilling effect because people are like, wow, this could happen, this can happen. And then I, I know Dean Nelson, when she was talking about earlier about um, the vulnerabilities that can happen in the moment, that's the classic know your rights workshop situation where you hear it, you see it, you understand it, FBI or ICE is at your door and all your rights are out the window because your own personal vulnerabilities come out. So it's how do we imp really truly empower communities? It's, it's not any easy and I don't have a quick answer to that, but I would also like to mention that um, we have to be very careful of perpetuating um, systems of control and hierarchies within communities. The classic example is that we all have you know, um, agendas and other agendas. For example, many of us are women doing this work, and so when we get into a lot of these communities, how do we work within the power structures without also enabling a known male hierarchy um, that dominates our communities? But then also when we're trying to dismantle that, are we doing that from a proper place, or have we bought into first world feminism? <laughs> And are we coming from a pure feminist perspective that's from the community, within the community, and honors the community? And so these are some of the classic um, conundrums that we face doing some of this movement work. I'll just, I'll just be really quick. I mean, I think one of the things um, that worries me in this moment is, although there is such an incredibly rich black radical tradition of organizing, um, there is also a really, um, I think, equally persistent black tradition of organizing from the perspective of a masculinist subject. So, I mean, when really was the last time we had a mass mobilization around a black woman or a woman of color who was harmed, right, by the police or um, around gender regimes of imprisonment. So I do think that, like, in this moment, it's an opportunity for us to do something different, um, particularly giving given all of the tremendous organizing by women of color happening in this moment. Thank you for that. And I do, I do subscribe to that position where we shouldn't be looking at this from a deficit model, um, especially for Native communities, but from a, from a strength model. And I had a personal experience with this as, as a clinical law teacher. I found an article about Native American education and communities and assigned it for reading, for discussion with my class, and um, my students were not res responsive to it. They, it, the article started out with all the negative statistics mm -hmm. that, I, that I mentioned before, and they said, that's not who we are. I, and there's a little bit of a, a tension there because we are people who grew up on the reservation with very little um, 
and so can identify with some of those statistics either in our family or in our personal lives or people that we know or, or we work with but at the same time that's not who we are we are so much more than that and in and to just be defined by all the negative aspects of a community is um, not just demoralizing, but, but is damaging. And so I like to think about all of the beautiful, healthy Indian families that I know that don't get in front of the federal criminal justice system because they're, they're working positively. And when I was a, a federal defender, we didn't always see those communities. And the people that I was working with began to stereotype the native community and they were helping them but they were still seeing them as these, these damaged um, people and so that's one thing that we can keep doing is talking about the positive things that we know about the Standing Rock Sioux and the Navajo and the Pueblo of Jemez and keep saying that over and over again um, because there are natives are here and they are doing brilliant beautiful work and we're, we're not just um, a statistic that, that you see on the negative chart. Well, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you.